everyone. Welcome to Wool and Spinning. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as Well for Pearls. It is Saturday, April 24th of 2021 and I hope that this finds you really well. Um, welcome to new viewers. I hope that you find something that you're looking for here and welcome to returning viewers. Thank you so much for continuing to watch the show week in, week out. If you don't mind taking a moment to hit subscribe and like, I would really appreciate that. And to our Patreon uh, subscribers, thank you so much for keeping the lights on here week after week. You guys mean the world to me and uh, it's been really fun over the last almost five years to sort of build relationship and build this community. So thank you. If you have any questions or you're wondering about anything that goes on here at Wool and Spinning, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, Rachel at wellforpearls.com is probably the easiest way, just via email. Um, so welcome. I hope you guys are doing really well. It has been a week, let me tell you. <laughs> I feel like this week just went like that. It was so fast. We had this beautiful weather and now we're back to rain and cold, but we really need the rain, so I'm not complaining at all. And it's been uh, lovely to um, be able to be outside as much as, much as we have been. Um, thank you, Kaylee, for your uh, comments. Um, in my, uh, this is the one of the vests that I knit earlier um, in 2020. I think I, when did I finish it? I can actually remember. Anyways, it's from Vogue Knitting. It was a pattern that I wanted to knit forever and it was chilly this morning, but not enough to throw on like an actual like sweater. Um, so I went upstairs and I grabbed it. I've been finding actually that I grab it more and more. Um, I just have gotten used to wearing it. It's because it's so long and it's a little bit big, uh, which is kind of the look. Um, I find that I don't necessarily go for it that often and recently in this shoulder season I've been pulling it out a lot so that's been really great um yeah it made the week fly by you're right Diana this the sweet sunny weather yeah it made it just go so so fast we were outside every day we've been working in the backyard and um it's been uh really lovely to work out there and to kind of figure out what our plan is and actually get on top of it and do some landscaping get some stuff and we planted a magnolia tree last weekend and we've got a dogwood to go in um we won't plant it this weekend but hopefully we'll be able to get it in the next week or two so really positive things um how are you guys i see the chat has just gone crazy i tried to go back and catch up and read um welcome to everybody that's here today uh, for those who are sort of new to this space and new to this area, um, new to wool and spinning, the live stream every Saturday morning is for patrons of the community. Uh, you do not need to um, uh, be in any special tier or subscribe to anything special. Uh, it's just for, for the patrons of the community. So welcome and thank you for, for being here. In today's show, I've got a whole bunch of samples and whatnot to talk to you about and to share with you. Um, I have some spinning that I was, I really was trying to get it done yesterday, but it kind of, everything went off the rails yesterday uh, because um, I had these grand plans of doing all of this spinning yesterday afternoon while book club, uh, we were finishing up our um, um North and South study and so we wanted to finish our study on North and South by uh, watching um, uh, the BBC production of North and South together and it's a four-part series and each episode is an hour and I've seen the series many times it's one of my my favorite um, things and uh it was funny because yesterday afternoon it has never gone so fast like honestly the hour just went like that it was just gone and we all commented on on how quickly it went and how quickly our morning went so or our afternoon went so we are going to be watching the next part next time we'll see how it goes whether or not we can watch two parts per afternoon so i had these grand plans of being able to do all this spinning and then um it kind of got to like more than halfway through us watching and we had been chatting a bit and you know just doing what we do best and just offering one another fellowship and community and um next thing i know i had like basically got nothing done because <laughs> i was hoping to spin while while i was watching but i hadn't eaten lunch and i'd been on uh the phone in the morning for an hour and it was quite an intense conversation right before like i hung up on the conversation on the phone and then um hit um, the zoom link so it's just you know how you have those mornings where you're just like where is the time going and then I picked up the kids after school 
and there's been a lot going on at school lately and uh, I ended up having them both on the floor here on our rug we've got a big area rug in our living room and basically both of them lying on the floor crying so that was fun <laughs> so another two hours of just sitting on the floor and being with and being present and listening to their to their gripes and what was going on so you got anybody who lives life <laughs> understands that things throw a uh, curveball in sometimes. So if you're interested in the um, uh, book club, please don't hesitate to have a look on the Slack channel if you're a part of that. Um, it's one of the tiers on Patreon and anything from that tier up is uh, includes you in the Slack channel and I send you an invite sort of as soon as I can. Uh, sometimes if I'm at work, I, I can't do that right away. But um, uh, we've kind of got this sort of grassroots uh, book club going. So our next books have been announced. They are on the on the channel. And uh, we've got one fiction uh, that we're studying and reading. And then the other one is a nonfiction. So we're doing, I know for the nonfiction, we're doing a women's, wor uh, wom women's work. Uh, and then I can't remember what our fiction is. It's a sci-fi. Um, yeah, so we're kind of flipping back and forth. Um, our, our, it's kind of interesting what's happened because we're sort of studying textiles and everything, like a lot of what we're choosing sort of has this underlying theme of textiles. Um, and then originally our plan was sort of to have like a separate anti-racism group, but it's all kind of ended up molding into one. Um, and so we're kind of, you know, at, at any given point, we've got a fiction novel going and a non-fiction novel going. And that seems to have really worked in just rolling it all into one. So if you are interesting, interested, interesting, everybody's interesting. If you are interested, please don't hesitate to jump in with us. Um, oh, Diane, I'm, I, I thank you for your empathy. <laughs> I felt like sitting on the floor and crying for two hours yesterday too. Well, you had a stressful phone call. So that on top of everything, um, you and I probably needed to have a glass of wine last night together or maybe a cup of tea. Claudia says, I feel you with crying kids. My daughter is so emotional and it's draining. Yeah, and you know, school is so stressful for the kids. So, um, you know, I think that uh, there's a lot that happens in that six hours that they're away and there's been a, a lot this year and I think it's all kind of bubbling up and over the surface. And that's actually what my phone call was this, yesterday morning was, was about sort of what's going on. So yeah, uh, my daughter is emotional, is 30 and still emotional. You know what, Kathy, I'm 37 and I'm still emotional. <laughs> I, um, I'm actually really thankful that one of the gifts that my mom gave me was, um, they call it the gift of your tears, but the, uh, being able to be in touch with that side of you, um, as long as it leads to resilience. I mean that, you know, being emotional for the sake of being emotional is not, not particularly helpful, but, uh, so, um, I've got a few things to chat about. We can, why don't we start with, um, a couple of things that I was carting up over the, over the course of the week. It was for the Demystifying Flax series that, uh, OHS is doing, the Ontario Hand Weavers and Spinners Association. Um, and, uh, we'll just kind of get into talking about some of that stuff. I've got some sweater progress on my finale. I haven't worked on anything else. Uh, my Florence tank is kind of on hold right now just because I was working on some other things. So my plan is to take it, uh, to start taking it to work. Um, I cast on for the cruiser, which we talked about last week, that bright garish orange. Um, but I haven't worked on it because of working on other things, but I did get, uh, the swatch done for my, my, um, um, Aurealis sweater. Um, and I'm not totally sure what I'm going to do with it. Um, it's pretty, um, well, we'll talk about it. So, uh, and then we've got some really great, uh, community participation that we're going to talk about. So um, without further ado, let's, let's get into it. thought because the episode is called sampling and play I thought that maybe we should start with what I have been sampling and working on oh my goodness 
my e spinner almost just fell on the floor. Um, so I have actually been, this has been stuff that we've been working on in the um, wool circle. So the wool circle is the live stream that happens um, every other Friday uh, and it's for subscribers of that particular tier on Patreon. And we get onto the wheel and we talk about some of the things that just don't get onto the podcast. And um, so Diane Sanderson and I at Sanjo Silk here in Vancouver, we've been sort of... Um, talking about building another uh, spin box and uh, because y you guys um, seem to really enjoy the process of and the excitement of being able to sort of sample all these different fibers and, and work through all of this different stuff and it's really exciting for me um, because it means that not only do I get to spin some different things I also get to speak to them and, and help you guys along your journey with them. So we've been spinning these up on the um, wool circle and uh, these two we did earlier this month. So th these have ended up being just absolutely fascinating. So this is Tassa, 100% Tassa. And it's, it's very, very light golden in color. And it's got these neps in it. And so spinning through the naps was really, really interesting. And I found that as I was spinning, um, my fingers had to really be conscious not to uh, really push down on the singles, but instead allow those naps to come through and allow that, that texture to come through to sort of allow that to work its way the, into the twist and to capture all those little sort of fuzzy bits and those little um, uh, sort of fibers uh, of the naps into the spinning and into the tussa. And what's so fascinating is this is 100% tussa next to it. So, and this is a three ply, this is two ply. Um, you can see sort of how the naps change the texture of the yarn. Um, to, to, to the untrained eye from a distance, I would almost say that this is like some sort of a paper or flax or like if I, if I didn't know any better and I was, um, um, you know, just really sort of, you know, just didn't know. Um, I would maybe say that this was like spun paper or um, something manufactured or um, it's really, really hard to tell. And then when you put it next to the 100% Tussa, so same, same base fiber, um, you can really see the texture even more so. So I don't know if I can hold these up a little bit closer for you guys so that you can really see. For some reason, the Tessa with Neps has a bunch of uh, fiber stuck to it, but the, the camera is very bright, so it is hard to see, but you can see how this one is much smoother and there's lots of sheen. Um, and this one still has a lot of sheen, but it's much more textured. It's also a two ply, so that's gonna be a little bit different. Um, and this three ply came out just absolutely amazing. So this is a three ply. I had spun Tessa for our uh, silk study back in January and February of this year. I had spun the Tessa two ply. So I wanted an opportunity to be able to spin it three ply. So it just came up absolutely beautifully. I used my very fast flyer on the Lendrum. Um, so I was spinning at like 44 to one or 48 to one or whatever that, that top ratio is. And, um, you can see, um, just that gorgeous, that gorgeous twist and the silk almost kind of like each of the, um, each of the bumps in the twist. So the, you know, if you were looking at bumps per inch or something to calculate your twist per inch, um, they almost kind of look like pearls, which is kind of neat. And I was actually really surprised because I spun this so fast. Um, I felt like I just blasted through the fiber so quickly. Um, I almost kind of felt like it was um, um, spun like inconsistently. Like I was worried that I wasn't spinning as consistently as I normally do. Um, but it just it just spun like that. And I, it was very, very consistent. Um, so maybe that speed helped a little bit. I'm not sure. I'll undo the Tessa with naps so that you can really see it. And uh, I'll lay it next to the Tessa so that uh, so that you can see sort of the difference between those two. So I don't know if I can zoom in a bit more. That's as far as the camera will go, but that just amazing. Very light, just that golden, just that ivory. You can really see the color up here. It's that ivory color. And uh, so those that was really fun to see those two side by side. So then taking it one step further, which one did you enjoy the most? That's a great question, Diane. You know, to be honest with you, 
In terms of fun spinning and textured spinning, I really enjoyed the Tessa with Naps because it was totally different. It was a surprise. I honestly didn't think that I would enjoy it and I didn't think that I would like the finished yarn. So I think what would, the one that was the most surprising was the Tessa with Naps. The one that I enjoyed spinning the most and the one that I would want to spin again is the 100% Tessa. However, I'm partially saying that because I got to spin the Tessa with Naps and because I had spun Tessa before, so I knew what to expect. Um, in terms of creating the spin box, because the next one will have six samples in it for you guys to play with, I would, of these two, I would absolutely include the Tessa with Naps personally. If that was something that you guys were interested in, um, in pursuing and, and, and spinning, I would definitely include that one. So the next one, taking the study one step further, so building on the naps, um, was Tessa Recombed Waste. So this was fascinating. Um, this was a really interesting spin. And for those who uh, participate in the wool circle, you guys will really appreciate um, when you went, if you had to go back and rewatch or if you were there for the live stream, um, this one caused me quite a bit of problem trouble. So when I first started spinning this one, I, it was, it was challenging. Um, it was true cloud like form. And this one is, um, camel and tussa silk, camel down and recombed tussa silk waist or silk waist. I guess I should say it's not necessarily just tussa. I just dropped a bunch of stuff on the floor. Sorry guys. So it's the recombing silk waist, 65%, um, and the 35% baby camel down. I am so sorry. I just hit the mic. That was probably really unpleasant to hear. Um, so 65, 35. And what made this one really fascinating was all of that baby camel down was in a, uh, cloud like form. So you've got it in your hand and you're holding it in your hand. And then as you're drawing back and you're allowing that twist to run up into the singles, um, you're drawing back in sort of that true long draw form. And I was trying to draw the same amount every time. So sort of, uh, more of an English long draw and treadling the same number of times for the same distance of draft to end up with a really super consistent yarn. But no matter what I did, slowing down, slowing down the ratio, so not spinning on such high a ratio. Um, I even tried it on a different wheel. No matter what I did, because of the fineness of the baby camel down, it absolutely would not spin anything but lace fine. So I ended up three plying it to build, to build bulk. So this is definitely one of those yarns where you're going to spin and spin and spin and spin and spin. And it is so light and so, um, airy and fine, um, that the, the, the sort of the one ounce goes really, really far. Um, and so of course what ended up happening was you've got these lace fine singles and with the recombed waist in there, it just creates this. I mean, you've got baby camel down to start with, and then you've got that lace, that recombed waist in there. And it almost kind of looks like cotton when it's done. This very much to the untrained eye is sort of like, oh, is that cotton? It feels nothing like cotton. Um, well, I shouldn't say that it not nothing like cotton, but it doesn't feel like cotton. Um, it's got incredible drape. It just hangs just beautifully. Um, no elasticity or memory or anything. Same as the other ones. There's no scales. There's no crimp. Um, and then because you've got this recombed waist in there, just like you have with the Tassa, with the naps, it gives you that, that little bit of texture. And this was very, very challenging to spin. I'm, I'm not going to pretend that it wasn't. This was very, very challenging to spin. Um, I would absolutely put this into the spin box mostly to challenge you guys. Um, and because it's just absolutely exquisite. Um, so it would be maybe one of those fibers that you would save for last. Um, or maybe, you know, we could chat and kind of help you to work through that, but it needs an incredible amount of twist. And even this spun applied as a three ply, even this could go a bit tighter. Um, even this could go, could go up to a tighter, um, twist and it would still be fine. It's focusing on my ring and not on my, not on me, not on the yarn. 
but yeah, you could totally put even more twist in this and you would be fine. That's crazy, hey? Just crazy. It's so, so luxurious and fine and um, soft. It's so soft. So it'll be interesting to see over time if some of those uh, naps, um, some of the recombed waste, if it maybe kind of worked its way free over time. I do wonder about that. Um, but I'll have to do something with it and kind of report and report back. Yeah, that's really, uh, really an important comment actually, Katie, or Katie, Kelly. Um, I was looking at Karen and Kelly at the same time and said, Katie, um, camel is tough if it's not prepped well. The mill has to really know what it's doing. I would agree. Um, it's so fine and, um, it's, uh, this particular prep was really beautifully done. Um, and I think the, what made it so interesting was throwing in that silk waste. Um, that was really, that was really cool. Yeah. Um, oh, that's awesome. Alberto found uh, a Tessa in her, in her stash. Uh, me and Silk are not friends. Okay, good luck. If it's really compacted and it's really difficult to spin, go along the fiber. So I'm going to show you on yarn just because that's what I have in, in uh, close to me. But go along the, if it's dyed, um, go along and go like this, like really, really hard. Um, because if it's not drafting well and it's not... Um, if the fibers aren't moving well, it's probably still got a whole bunch of Saracen on it, which is from the silk glands of the silk worms. And it just needs to be broken up. And some of that can be in the dyeing process too. So if it's dyed Tessa, just give it, go all the way along and give it like a good, firm, hard snap all the way along several times. Um, what would you use the finished yarns for? What types of projects? Great question. Um, the, oh, I thought I said he, I know it's a he, <laughs> he's a he, they's a he. Um, thank you, Eve. Uh, uh, the finished projects, you know, to be honest with you, I think you, I, I think all of these would really do well in something woven. Um, they're very high twist. These two anyways are very high twist. This one I could add twist to, um, although it's not bad. No, this one's still pretty high twist too. I'm not sure if I would want to put these ones that have the uh, waist in them and the neps and whatnot. I'm not sure about putting them on the loom and how that would fare. I would have to talk to Erica about it. Um, and uh, just because I wonder if the neps would kind of work their way free um, as you beat um, going through the, the uh, reed or on a rigid heddle going through the heddle. Um, as you beat and as you move it, especially cause on the rigid heddle, there's a lot of, um, uh, you're using a plastic reed and you've got that, just that abrasion. Um, I found that my yarns in some ways kind of went through a lot more on the, um, on my, my floor, on uh, my uh, rigid heddle when it had this kind of texture in it compared to my floor loom. I would love to hear from others what your experience is. Um, I could totally see myself doing, um, a shawl. These would be just awesome for a shawl. Um, I did make these two a three ply because of just needing to bulk them up a bit because if I had two plied them, they would have been just way too fine for knitting. So that's where the, like that kind of catch 22 comes in. Like, do you want to be knitting on two millimeter needles for a lace fine shawl? Or do you want to be working on weaving and doing, um, uh, and doing something um, like that, you know, um, where you're setting it really fine, um, a close set and a close weave. Like I, I, yeah, I think you could do either. Yeah. So <laughs> where were you when I wanted to do this 15 years ago? Oh, Karen, the, uh, um, the, the joys of modern technology too. Hey, like that's really a huge part of it. So this is the third sample and I chain plied this mostly just to manage, uh, just because I didn't want to rewind my singles onto a whole bunch of weaving bobbins. This one is the 50, 50 Merino silk that we were spinning. And this came out just absolutely beautifully. Um, it's quite high twist, um, for, for a three ply. It's almost a wee bit flat. It didn't poof up as much as I thought that it would. Um, and I think part of that is just the amount of twist that I put into it. Let me see if I can show you a bit up close. Um, my nails have just been absolutely through the, through the wars cause I had them done for the sweet Georgia filming. And then, uh, they, now they're, 
all breaking and anyways you guys know what it's like um or some of you probably do and of course working with water and soap and you know our our hands get go through the go through the ringer anyways um so the this ended up being quite high twist i spun very fine singles i have spun 50 50 merino before this particular blend before i felt like this one was different for some reason i don't know if the source was different or if it was just I was spinning it differently or if I just came to it differently I'm not totally sure the other skein is right over here so I will keep talking and I will grab it because I think it's important to see the two side by side um, so this is the other one I meant to grab it this morning and I totally forgot for you guys it is bright white. I do wonder, Eve, if it was bleached because the other one that I have is not as white. This one is more of an ivory. I would consider this one to be more natural, um, but this one is so white. Um, so I do wonder, I think they are different fibers. Um, I don't think that they're the same. Um, this one spun so fine. No matter how I handled it, it just drafted beautifully fine. And this one, um, uh, was more, more spun like wool, to be honest with you. Um, but it's 50, 50, they're both 50, 50 Merino, but like I said, they, they're very, very different. They're different in color. They spun very differently. Um, here are the two of them side by side so that you can really see them. So one of them spun up to be a sport weight and the other one spun up to be a fingering. One's white, 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 white. And the other one is th that beautiful kind of wooly, white ivory color one's three ply this one is the three ply um, and this one's the two ply this one poofed up just an incredible amount in the washing process it was almost a little bit hard to spin consistently because it was so springy and this one was more like spinning silk um, it drafted like silk it felt like silk it spun like silk um, it's really interesting because my i had knit years ago uh multnomah by kate ray um, it's a shawl. It's a triangular shawl. It's got a feather and fan pattern toward the end. And uh, you do garter at the top. And I had done um, a Hedgehog Fibers uh, Fiber Club 50-50 uh, merino and silk spin. And, I had, it, it, and it had spun exactly like this. So when I went back to spinning this and when I saw the finished yarn, I was like, that is so fascinating because that is exactly what that fiber spun like. It was totally different from this one. So different, 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 different fibers. So this one would be really cool to include in the um, silk, in the Sanjo box so that it would give you guys an opportunity to see what that spins like. It would also be really neat to see this one dyed. Um, so that's really fun. And then the last one that I have is a little bit different. This doesn't have any wool. Um, this one is 50-50. Hang on, it's all messed up. 50-50 uh, um, silk and linen, flax. So let me just untangle it because it's really badly tangled now for some reason. It was all perfect and now it's not. Don't you just hate that when your skeins are so great and then you pull them apart and you're like, what happened? What did I do? So not fair. So very white. Oh, Zen, you're hilarious. Um, Zen, you always make me laugh. Um, so this is the, let me move this one out of the way because it's so poofy and lovely. Uh, this is 50-50 uh, silk and flax. And I thought that this would be really difficult to spin. And it wasn't at all. It was just like butter. It drafted beautifully. The texture of this, so it's Bombix um, um, mulberry. Um, the texture of the flax came through beautifully and, um, there's it, even for, for a 50, 50 blend, it feels like there should be more flax in there and more, more sort of now that it's finished, I can call it linen, but, um, it hangs like, like linen. It hangs like, um, it, 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 it there's drape, but it's a little bit heavier. It's a little bit denser. Um, it's not as light. The skein is a little bit messed up, but you can see how it just hangs got that lovely I chain plied this so it's a little bit thicker than what I had originally planned um, and then you can see off the back of the uh, silk off the back of the yarn there there's those little tendrils of the of the um, 
the linen coming through. I did not wet spin this because, um, um, well, to be honest with you, I didn't want to get the silk wet and have to deal with wet silk while I was trying to spin. So those are all of my samples that I've been playing with. So if there's anything that really speaks to you that you would really, really uh, want to, like you really desperately want to see included in the in the next silk box, please let me know. Um, and you guys can uh, help to build that. Um, a couple of the things that are going into the silk box, um, regardless of the six items, we are absolutely going to include the silk and linen. And we are absolutely going to include um, the silk hankies. So those are two things that are going into the silk box um, that are, are sort of non-negotiable. Um, the 50-50 silk linen, yeah, it's 50-50. Um, it's so um, you've got, you've just, oh no, you're right, Eve. You're absolutely right. I am so sorry. It's 65-35 silk and linen. You're absolutely right, Eve. Yeah, nailed it. Silk and flax, please. Yes, totally, Dorothy. That's going in. And the silk hankies are going in. So I just need to know from you guys for the silk hankies um, if you want them dyed or not. Um, I think some people want them dyed and some people don't. Um, I just need to know from you guys uh, what you would prefer. So that's the only thing that we're kind of, I'm kind of, as I'm organizing an email to get back to Diane about this, and about what we want to see, um, that's the one thing that I need to come up with. So I've been keeping my little sample skeins, my little play skeins, I've been keeping them in their little baggies so that I don't have to make a whole bunch of um, labels for them, and then I've been keeping them organized. So it's kind of just an easy way of uh, keeping my stuff organized for now um, until we kind of readdress this in the summer. So uh, that's been actually kind of neat. So let's move on. Uh, Karen would like to see the Tessa with Neps. That's fantastic. I can absolutely put that on the list. Um, I would love to have you guys, um, Dana says the same thing. I would love to see you guys have that one only because um, uh, I think the this one, the, the Tessa with Neps, um, I think this one is just, it, you see it on the market, you see it around, you see it offered. It would be great to give you guys an opportunity to spin that and to spin that all together. Um, so definitely, definitely a lot of fun. I have been carding up a storm this past week and this is actually for some more of this yarn. Um, I have been spinning for, uh, more meadow yarn. So this was a blend that is a commercial blend. Um, it's a, it's a yarn available by, from the fiber company and it's 40% wool, 20, 25% camelid, 20% silk and 15% excuse me, sorry, 15% linen. Um, that's what's given on the website. So I've used toe flax um, and I used tassa for the silk, um, white alpaca and um, natural uh, BFL. And I've been carding it up. And I, the reason why I did another 100 grams and the reason, and actually I put this through four times or maybe five times. I just could not get it nicely blended like I did last time. I'm not sure if maybe I just am forgetting how many times I put it through last time. Anyways, I did 100 grams um, because I am actually thinking my original plan with this yarn was to do um, another shore vest. Um, I did it before and I had ripped it out and I was sort of thinking based on my results from this um, that I would um, do another another uh, shore, shoreline vest. I think it's shoreline vest by Carrie Bostick Hogue. Um, it's a great pattern. It's part of the knit main, the, the, that, that collection. And I was going, and I had, knit, I've knit it before and I was really regretting pulling it out. So I was going to re-knit it after, um, spinning the yarn for it. And I, um, I'm trying to find it here for you guys so I can link it for you. Here it is, the shoreline vest. And um, I had it all dyed in logwood and I started knitting. I cast on the wrong number of stitches. I had to rip it out. Um, and I'm actually thinking now instead, um, I, I wanted to card this up for the Demystifying Flax series. Um, so that's going to be presented in next month. Um, and this is part of it. Um, instead, I was actually thinking really seriously about... Um, leaving the white white and um 
and doing the, hang on, I'm, I'm trying to link something for you guys here. Um, and doing the cyan by uh, Elizabeth Dor 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 Doherty instead. So I was sort of thinking like if the purple logwood skeins are the background and then the white is the foreground um, for that sweater, um, I'm, I'm kind of actually thinking that maybe that's what I'll do. Um, I'm going to do a swatch and kind of see if that would maybe be something that I would want to pursue. But the yarn is just the absolute perfect uh, gauge. Um, it would have beautiful drape and the white would really be a lovely texture, um, color and texture to sort of um, highlight the yarn, um, but also um, contrast for the white. And then I'm not trying to match dye colors because that logwood is, I probably can't get that exact same uh, thing again. So uh, for the main color, um, I would need about 600 yards and that's actually almost exactly what I have spun. Um, it's between six and 700 yards of the pink and I could always bring the color work down the body like many in our community are doing um, just to make the, the purple go a bit further. So yeah, lots of thoughts and lots of things that I'm thinking about in terms of that. So that was something that I was working on. And then the other thing that I was working on was my uh, Aurealis sweater. So this is my Gotland. It's a two ply thread box from Spunky Eclectic, December, 2020. And uh, I spun my gray Gotland last weekend and I never got to tell you guys because it was on Sunday. Uh, it was such a beautiful weekend last weekend and we all spent lots of time outside. And uh, it was really cool because I was, uh, I went outside with my, my spindle because I wanted to finish this little sample. And uh, I was sitting on the, on the grass outside and the, one of the girls in the cul-de-sac, she's nine, she's in grade four and she came over and she was kind of looking at what I was doing and she was asking a couple of questions. And so then I was like, well, McKenna, do you want me to just go grab you a spindle and I'll teach you how to spin? So we sat out there for five hours and I taught her how to spin and she's still going at it. She's still spinning. So unfortunately it's raining right now because I told her that we would work on it today, but if we don't, I'm working tomorrow. So if we don't get to it, um, I'll definitely make a date with her for later in the week. So, um, that was really, really cool. And she worked on it for basically all day. Um, and then she worked on it all day on, um, on, uh, um, that was on Saturday afternoon. I said Sunday, but it was Saturday afternoon. And then she worked on it all day Sunday, which was really, really cool. So Um, so this is my, so I ended up knitting a swatch. So after I finished the yarn, I washed it and, uh, I finished it right away. And this is the swatch for the Arealis sweater. So, um, I had talked to Eve about this, who's actually in the chat today. Um, and she, her and I were both saying like, we're not sure that there's enough contrast between the two yarns. And so I said, well, I'm going to knit the swatch and I'll see, um, see what happens. And we, I think we had talked about it in the live stream as well. So I knit the swatch and exactly what I was concerned about happening has sort of happened because down here there's actually color work and you really, you can't see it at all. And then this is color work up in here. And of course you can see the purple against the, the gray, but when you hold it back here, there's just absolutely no contrast. So, um, I think there's two things that I can do. Uh, the first thing is to just use a different background. Um, so instead of doing 100% Gotland, I'll just pivot and do something else for the background. Um, the other thing I can do is use the Gotland um, and they're both Gotland, but I mean the gray Gotland. Um, the other thing that I can do is just use the gray Gotland for, um, for the color work and use the thread box for something else. Um, and, um, I, I haven't really decided one way or the other just yet. I would like to sample and swatch some other things with, um, with the, uh, the thread box first before I make any decisions. Cause I just absolutely love the look of this. It's just not high enough contrast. So, um, and the swatch itself is, it's not prickly. This is definitely next to the skin soft a little bit prickly on my neck but I mean it's nothing Nora was complaining that her let low piece sweater was a bit prickly and so we were talking about how you sort of increase your ability to tolerate um, those sort of uh, toothy fibers and uh, we were talking about this little little square and 
she was putting it against her, her neck and stuff and she was saying, yeah, that doesn't really feel very good. And um, it's a little bit toothy, but I would always have a shirt underneath. So anyhow, I'm just not sure how, what I'm going to do. And I'm just going to keep thinking about it. Keep it out. Keep it close by. Keep looking at it. It isn't easy to find a little, to show a child how to knit spinner weave. No, it was actually really cool too, because yeah, I agree, Wendy. It's too low contrast. Um, it was actually really cool because her and I sat out there and we um, uh, and we were um, spinning together. I just got Gotland right in my teeth and it just makes it feel awful. You know, like it just hit my mouth and it just, it feels so, ugh. It's got that awful, fun fact. You guys are probably like, you're weird, Rachel. <laughs> Yes, yes, I know. Um, my front teeth are implants. So I knocked my teeth out, my front teeth out when I was seven. And um, that's why my, my um, now you guys are always gonna notice it. So I, should, I shouldn't say anything. Um, but that's why my front teeth are not lined up properly. And there's a, um, it almost looks like a bruise above my teeth. Um, that's actually the, the hardware of the implant, um, uh, anchoring my front teeth. So um, I had, uh, I knocked um, backyard swing sets, my friends, very dangerous things. And my front teeth got caught in the chains. So um, that was at my se at a seventh birthday party at, of my best friend at that time. And, um, she moved away. She moved to Calgary and we, when we were in grade five and we are, we still keep in touch. And every time I see her mom, she always is like, how are your teeth? <laughs> so, um, anyways, when things hit the front of my mouth, it, um, it's like hypersensitive. So probably too much information, but there you go. Um, you always learn fun things about each other. So on my e-spinner, I am actually at the plying stage of my fin silk. So this is my fin silk spin. This is from Kingdom Fleece and Fiberworks. I don't know if Liz is here today. I know they've been really busy um, uh, doing sugaring and whatnot. So um, I spun all of my singles this week and got them all um, organized. I ended up spinning the rest of the singles uh, to my Magicraft bobbin. And um, I had wound them off just for storage. Um, these are woolen spun singles, so I, I wasn't rewinding to get to the first spun end or anything like that. Um, and then I went to two ply it and I threw it on my e-spinner so that I could work on it in our bed at night and I just plugged in the battery. Uh, but the thing is, you guys are gonna laugh at me, the yarn is so fine, because I wanted this as part of my natural shades along to go with my Rambouillet and my Fin that I've spun from Long Way Homestead. But this yarn is so fine that my, what I'm actually wondering about, and I'll make a decision this week, and I would love, love, love to hear what you guys think. So let me just cue it, let me just fix this first so I can show you. I'm actually wondering about making this into a cabled yarn because it is so fine and there is gonna be so much of it um, that I kind of am wondering, let me just get a little bit more twistness because it's been sitting all night so it's a little bit relaxed now. If I had done this last night, it would have just gone right into it because I'm putting more, I'm gonna have to put more twist into it if I wanna cable it. But basically, I'm kind of wondering about doing a cable yarn because um, it would bulk it up a little bit. I wouldn't be able to use it for my um, natural shades along for those with those particular yarns, but look at how beautiful this is. Come on, give me more. Look at that. It's very rustic. And it would just be, oh, that chain link would just be absolutely beautiful. So I'm kind of wondering about maybe going, putting it, after I finish plying it, I'm kind of wondering about putting it back through the wheel and um, adding a bit more ply twist to it. Um, I can do that really quickly and easily on the on the e-spinner, on my, on my this is my, the Ash, Ashford e-spinner three. And I could, I could bulk it up and I could make a cable yarn. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking that maybe I would do that. Yeah, it looks great as a cable. Thank you, Dorothy. And it's, yeah, dimension, it's dimensional. That's right, such a dimensional. And it's a 50-50, no, it's not 50-50, but it's quite high um, fin and silk. Um, Jennifer's getting the other four ounces that I have um, that was from Liz. Um, Jennifer, I just haven't sent it out yet. I need to go to the post office, but I'm, I'm kind of needing to collect everything because I owe Kelly 
the try it on tubing and I owe Maria the Targi. Um, so I've got th uh, three things to kind of package up and send out. So thank you for your patience. Um, but I just, I don't know, I kind of like it. And I made another cable yarn this past week, which is kind of funny because I never spin cable yarns and here I am making like a whole bunch of things. And I'm kind of thinking that I'll cable it. And actually, Diane, great question. And then what would you make with it? It would make a DK weight yarn. So it would take it from being a heavy fingering up to a DK. And I have so much DK weight yarn in my stash, white, gray, um, hand spun stuff, colored stuff. Um, I actually think that I would put it with something else and do something with it. Um, because I just need to like combine some things to kind of get stuff knit up, if that makes sense. Yeah, so super cool. And it's been really easy plying on the e-spinner. It's been really, really fun and really, really, really easy. I've really enjoyed doing that. So the last thing I wanted to share with you today is my Fennel. Um, this is by Orlane Souche, and I actually separated for the sleeves and the yoke this week. So um, I had mentioned to you guys last time that I really can't work on this for any length of time. I really can only do a section which works out to about 10 rows and then I have to put it down. So I've actually started knitting on the body now and I was really worried that it was going to be too big as I was knitting the yoke because with the yoke you work those saddles and then you work some more increases and then you work a traditional raglan. So I was really worried because it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And actually I don't have my actual project right here because I think I've put it somewhere I need to wind more yarn. And um, once I separated for the sleeves and I got that all done and I, I put it on the dress form and I put it across at the front, I was like, oh my goodness, this is brilliant. What a wonderful way to build the yoke because there isn't so much bulk in here. You get the, the needed room in the saddle. You get the needed room for the armhole. It's almost kind of like a hacked contiguous construction. And now I'm working on the body and there's lots of ease. I can close it once the button band goes on, it'll be perfect. Like how brilliant. So I've been really enjoying working on this and you can see the curling, curly Q nature of the stitches in of the Romney. Um, this again was a three ply Romney and you can see that the stitches just don't lay really super straight and really super flat. And that's the long wool nature of, of the Romney. So really cool. I'm excited to get this done and washed because I think it's just going to be beautiful. I loved the swatch that I did of this, of this yarn. And, uh, I, I, I know that sort of everything will relax and just, you know, drape and fall and it'll be really rustic looking and really kind of fun. I might put a wash over this, something kind of with a, with a very gentle pink tone. Um, but I might, I might also just leave it naturally colored. I'm not sure. So it's knit on four millimeter needles. Great question, Eve. Um, it's four millimeter needles and, um, it calls for, so I got gauge on four millimeter needles, I should say. Um, I got gauge on four millimeter needles and um, I'm knitting size one because it's built in, the pattern is built in with ease, which I love. Um, so it sort of gives you, you, you based on your size, um, you pick the one that gives you the right amount of ease. So she gives recommendations and um, her sample is, um, size two with six inches of positive ease. Um, so that, uh, you could, you, from there you can kind of decide what you want to do. It's a little bit short. Um, you don't knit the bot. The body is actually only like 11 inches long. So for me, that's not long enough, but the yardage is really good because for the first three sizes, it's only, it's, it's a thousand or less yards of yarn. So that's really great. And you get a really good amount of, of positive ease with those sizes. So something to definitely look at. Um, yeah, so I've been really happy with that. Oh, right. Community participation. So this month we are giving away the bamboo version of, uh, Katrina's lava, lava love colorway. So, uh, Maria chose the Targi bamboo, uh, sorry, the Targi lava love. This is from crafty Jack's boutique and this is the Panda. So this is about 50 grams ish. And, um, I had linked the February stuff by accident. So for, 
Um, April, um, tell us about your garment. No, sorry. Tell us about um, your favorite mitten pattern. And let me just find uh, the link for you guys because I, I know that I've linked the wrong one in the, uh, uh, in the show notes. How might mixing types of plying in a project affect the finished garment? Will one yarn come forward more than another? Great question, Holly. So if you're mixing uh, different types of hand spun yarns, I have really found, um, and I know Sonia in the community, we had a conversation about it, her and I, um, it just doesn't seem to matter that much in the knitted fabric. Um, a lot of what will determine um, how your knitted fabric comes out and how your color work comes out is um, how you're carrying your yarns and whether or not you're carrying them over each other or one under and one over um, and how you're creating your dominant color more than how your yarns the structure of your yarns it's why combining two ply and three ply yarns or three ply and four ply or two ply and four ply why it doesn't really matter once you get into the knitted fabric um, for me personally what i've really found is um, the gauge is more important so whether or not they knit up at the same gauge and if one yarn is too light and too thin and the other one is too thick and too bulky then you're going to have problems unless that's the look you're going for so yeah I hope that's helpful. We have an ask anything from um, one of our community members. This is from Maria. Um, so this is an ask anything. So she said she's just bought a flat iron wheel, which is fabulous for long draw. And she's spinning up some gorgeous brown Romney fleece that she's prepped herself and carted into Rolex. She's spinning supported long draw at a ratio of 15 to one. And her question is, she wants to keep the light, lofty characteristics of the yarn. So would you ply it on a slightly larger whorl to softly ply it? And do you tend to ply on the same ratio? I'm curious to hear people's thoughts and I'm so used to just doing what I always do. I'm sure the answer will be to sample. Oh, Maria, you know us so well. Um, it is to just sample. But um, the... I, I think something to think about is um, when when I go to ply, I'm it, it, for me personally, it doesn't really matter what my ratio is or what what whirl I'm on. For me, it's what is the twist angle. So as I'm plying, I'm watching my twist angle, and sometimes I will count my treadles. If if you're on a treadle wheel, which you are, you're on a flat iron so that I get enough twist into my applied yarns. Um, with Romney, it's longer stapled. It's getting, it's sort of making that transition from medium to long wool. And um, you don't need tons and tons of twist um, to, to, to have a structurally stable yarn, unless it's really short stapled or it's a, a lamb's fleece with really short fine staples. So what I do um, personally is, you know, I watch that twist angle. So I do tend to, I don't tend to ply on the same ratio because I don't tend to ply on the same wheel. I tend to kind of move things around and ply on different wheels and whatever's free and bobbin size is a consideration and, um, well, honestly, which wheel is free is a big one. Um, and yeah, and I watch my twist angle more than, more than anything. Yeah. Uh, Wendy has a really good comment about the uh, different twists in yarn. She knit a striped sweater with high twist and, and a low twist and it didn't not, it didn't work. I'm not sure exactly why, but it just felt weird. That's really interesting. I wonder if your high twist and your low twist yarns were biasing in different directions. So if your low twist yarn was biasing one way and your high twist was biasing the other way, and then you've almost got kind of like this garment that's trying to twist itself. I wonder, I, I'm just wondering. Um, if that is, is, um, maybe something. So for Maria, I would definitely do a little tiny sample and see what you think, but I would also really watch your twist angle and, uh, see what, see what you, uh, come up with. So this is from Maria, another Maria. This is our 51 yarns, um, group B. They are finishing up in, at the end of December, uh, which is really, really fantastic. Another two years of study. So group A finished in December, 2020, and now we've got group B finishing in December, 2021. I am happy to offer the 51 yarn study again, um, to, to go through JC Box Faulkner's book, 51 yarns to spin before you, uh, cast off. 
if that is something that you guys would like to do so that you actually stick to the book and you actually work your way through it over the 24 months, please let me know and we can start a group in January. Um, so Maria says, I got inspired to try to make sock yarn as my striped yarn for this challenge. Um, so we're doing uh, color right now, color management. We're in that section of the book. During Easter, I carded a few blends with drum with the drum carter and I did some rovings off. There is dyed blue Texel locks and BFL top to give the main color for the rovings and then white fin or a fin cross as the body. The white, blue or red mohair locks or gotland locks to give strength and de deepness for color. While spinning, I got the idea of trying both long draw and short forward. It was interesting that my short forward draw gave that thinner and more even yarn. So your short forward draw is always going to be your most consistent yarn. Even if your continuous back or your short back are very consistent, the most consistent yarn that you will spin when you compare your yarns across all the yarns that you make, your short forward will be the most consistent of all of your yarns. Um, so just in case you guys um, weren't aware of that, that's, that's the case. Also, the difference in luster is obvious. Um, and my long draw is still much in the, the learning curve and chain plying too. The colors are a bit less bright and I like the green, gray, teal skein the most. Now I should decide on a sock pattern. Beautiful, Maria. I think this turned out really, really well. I have to admit, my favorite one is that purpley one, um, which is maybe the one that you said. Um, you said, I think you said the green, gray, gray skein, this one, my favorite one is that one. I like both of them, but just beautiful. Yeah. Oh, Dorothy, <laughs> I'm interested in joining 51 yarns. I'm a group B dropout. All good, Dorothy. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like a group C. Okay guys, just let me know because, um, Nat, um, Nathalie wants to do it and, um, yeah, if you guys um, want to do a group C, we can absolutely work that in and do that for sure. Um, what seems to have worked the best for group B is to set up another tier on Patreon so that you guys just get specific content for, for that group. Um, so I will talk to you guys about that and I'll, I'll walk you guys through that. So this is from Alex. This is just beautiful. Um, I thought I'd share my breeding color study progress. I dyed three 100 gram braids of different naturally colored Shetland, gray, moret, and white, and gave half of each braid to a friend to play with. That's really cool. Um, for my spinning, I spun the moret brace as a two ply split in half and then one of the halves in three, aiming for a two ply fractal. Um, and she spun on her Lendrum uh, DT. I really liked how it came out in the Murat because the color shifts are so subtle. Yes, ditto, me too. I love that Murat braid. But I also love this one, the, the white one right here. That is really fun too. Um, I, so I tried the same with the gray, but it was a bit disappointed by how muddy it looked. So that's because of the gray base. Um, it probably just was a little bit too muted. Um, it, it's uh, it, next to the Murat, it probably just was a little bit, um, um, like I think if you hadn't have seen the Murat, you would love the gray, um, but the Murat worked so well, you know what I mean? It'll be neat to see that one uh, knit up. Given that, I did something different with the white braid. I split the braid horizontally in the unplied sections and aimed for colors to repeat in the same order when chain then chain plied. My theory was that it would stripe, so I immediately put it to the test and made a hat combining it with some undyed Shetland I had spun previously in randomish stripes. I love how gentle and blended the finished stripes look, and I'm excited to try doing this with other braids in my stash. That's amazing. I love that. Um, Alex, that's just perfect. I really want to play to see if I can get longer color repeats for a project with a bigger circumference, i.e. a sweater. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Kathy, you're in too. Okay. Um, I would like a group C as well. Sarah wants a, to do 51 yarns. Victoria wants to do it. Um, that's fantastic. Okay, guys, that's great. Um, Samantha. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll do it then. That's great guys. This was for our luxury fibers along that's going on all year. This is from Kathy. This was a lovely spin, uh, from left to right there, Mulberry, Tessa, Muga, uh, yellow and red Erie. And then the peduncle is that 
gorgeous gray brown at the very end. I tried not to spin too fine since I don't fancy knitting with super thin silk yarn. My plan is to knit some kind of shawl with the finished skeins, maybe incorporating the ones from the upcoming luxurious animals sampler, as well as some undyed woolly wool. I therefore tried to spin to the same ish wraps per inch. Only two samples refused. The mulberry wanted to spin finer and the peduncle wanted to spin thicker, but who am I to argue they all spun continuous backwards straight from the top without prepping the fiber in any way. I really couldn't tell which spun yarn I love most. The Erie and the Muga have just wonderful colors. The mulberry spun like butter. It was the softest of all of them. And the peduncle is great because it feels more wooly, but still has great shine. Perhaps the Tessa was the least exciting for me. I'm not hu a huge fan of its fuzziness, um, but it's still a lovely and luxurious yarn. I'm not sure if the yarns lost some of their sheen after soaking, and I suspect that the problem was that I squeezed out the water, and I seem to have somehow squeezed out the sheen as well. Um, they maybe just need a bit of a snap, uh, Kathy. The second half of the samples I rolled lightly in a towel, and that seemed to have worked better. Yeah, they probably just need a bit of a snap, and I, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but when I unskein my yarns, particularly my luxury yarns, I give them a really good hard firm snap. I'll show that to you now. Like I go like this, like really hard. Um, they just seem to need to come back to life. Um, they get really compacted in their skeins and I tend to keep them really loosely twisted. Um, I don't, I don't skein them really tightly like we do our wool. So maybe that'll help. Goals. That lineup is lovely. Yes, totally Holly. Um, I will be sitting down to spin more of my breeding color study today. That's awesome, Zan. Super nice silk spins, beautiful drooling. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Uh, this is Natural Shades. This is from Karen. Um, Karen uh, spun up her, she really should find a pattern for this. One fleece that I sorted the locks by color. So this is actually a gradient if you guys have a look across it. It was the most amazing adult Gotland fleece, shiny and drapey, but a bit heavy. Okay, the fleece was free and dirty, but looked nothing special and it is really amazing. Just not sure how to use it. The usual answer for me is a sweater, but since it is kind of heavy, it might not be the best choice. Maybe a blanket, but not sure I have enough. Got to check. Um, very interesting. So I am actually kind of in the same boat, uh, Karen, because, um, this Scotland, while spun beautifully and not, not dense, I think another pound of this in a sweater would not necessarily be the best, the best choice and the best option. And the more I look at it and the more I play with it and the more I feel it, the more I'm actually kind of leaning towards more of like a blanket shawl. So I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, so we'll have to chat. The sheen on that is amazing. Love your natural fade. Gorgeous. Yeah, really fun. So this is from Rebecca. She's knitting at the hockey rink in uh, Rankin Inlet in Nunavut, um, in, in Nunavut, northern, northern uh, Canada. Um, this is zero to hero. Hashtag sweater spin. Hashtag use your hand spun. Hashtag spin all the things. Uh, my first zero to hero sweater for 2021 is cast on. This is a gradient spun back in January, yellow through the orange, red, and brown. I shared that on the podcast. So she's actually like cast it on and is starting. Um, she'll use the colors in a way, uh, inspired by the comfort fade. That's a pattern by Andrea Mowry, if you're not familiar with it, but my gauge is totally different. So I'm using a pattern from interweave knits that she already has so far. So good. And the second sweater quantity is finished. That's this one. This is a blend of different colors of Cormo Alpaca, destined to be a wheel rigget by Kate Davies. After thinking about sweater spinning for years upon years, it's finally really going somewhere. I finished my first hand spun sweater just over a year ago. I now have three complete with two more in progress and another sweater quantity in the wings. It's really quite intoxicating when I stop to think about it, though really part of the trick for me is not stopping to think about it too often. Rebecca and I get very, very, um, analytically paralyzed. <laughs> uh, I think that's why we get along so well. Um, oh, Julia, you're here. Hello. Um, house baby. Uh, before I knew what I was doing with spinning, arguably, I still don't really know. Bless you. Um, I spun enough yarn for a Gotland sweater and now I have four pounds of Gotland sweater that is, isn't super wearable. That's really good to know. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, Maybe it be, <laughs> uh, 
Every time, oh my, oh, I can't even read that out loud. Uh, you should do the Stephen West Schlanklet. Sh 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 it um, says Claudia, and then Zan says you should be able to say Schlanklet every time someone asks you. <laughs> I'm not sure I could say it without like bursting out laughing. I'm knitting a Schlanklet. Oh my goodness, things are deteriorating, my friends. Things are deteriorating. This is from Marina. I absolutely love this. Thank you, Marina, for, for sharing this. Uh, I have put this sweater into my queue, and I don't know why. This is so crazy. Um, for some reason, I, 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 I don't know what happened. You guys were talking about this sweater on the Slack channel. People were posting this on, on the Slack channel and saying this would be a great a great hand spun sweater. I think I posted it on the Slack channel and said, Hey, this would be a great pattern for hand spun. Um, under hashtag hand spun sweater reflections. If you haven't found that channel on Slack yet, definitely have a look at that. And for some reason, it just didn't like compute with me that this might actually be something I would want to knit. Like I just, I, you know, when you just have that like cognitive disconnect, so this is from Marina. This is amazing. I just thought this was so beautiful through and, and her, her story is a phenomenal. So, um, do have a listen to this through knitting the plus one sweater by Camille de Cote. I was able to reconnect to my roots and my ancestors. I was able to feel a hug from my grandmother. I'm going to cry, uh, through the fibers of her, her hand spun. My mother had walked past this beautiful sheep in um, I think it's Charlet Vieux, most likely down lane, um, and asked the farmer what was going to happen to the fleece after he was all done shearing. And he replied, garbage. She collected everything she could and my grandmother sorted through it. Of course, after all that work, my mom didn't even knit with it and it was stashed for 30 years. So I cared for it, learned to spin for it and dreamed of a perfect pattern for it. As the yarn had sat for so for a long time, the twist was almost all gone. So to maximize yardage, I got into a process of untwisting and separating most of the two ply to be able to make a full sweater out of it, adding a contrast color. The contrast color is my first braid of organic merino spun on my brand new Magicraft rose. Does that count as a zero to hero when the project involved three generations. Hopefully my daughter will get to wear it one day too. Ha! Huh. Thank you, Marina, for sharing. That is just beautiful. And finally from Jennifer, this is sample spinning and play. I had to include this and these aren't even the photos that I meant to include. So just bear with me for a sec because I needed to update them. Hang on. I think I grabbed the wrong photos that I wanted to share of Jennifer's and actually if they're not here, I will post them next time. Oh shoot, where did they go? Um, she posted, so we had shared last time, I'll put those ones back up for you guys so that you can see them. Uh, for those who had missed them, uh, because Jennifer had actually shared a bunch of photos um, of how her wool stash ends up in her quilts. And I think by accident, I didn't, update the photos for us so that we could see them. Um, so I had, I, I had downloaded them, um, for you guys and I am not sure. Let me see if I can find them because then we've got a couple of minutes. Anyways, the show is long today per usual. Um, cause I had shared these with you guys last time, but then I had, um, she had posted more photos and I can't find them. So I'll have a look next time, but she, um, um, had posted more photos of, of what happens with her wool stash. And I wanted to share that with you guys. So, uh, we'll do that next time. So that's great. Um, I agree with you, Diane, that story wins best story award. Um, what a soulful project. Um, my whole life feels like a, <laughs> thanks, Anne. That makes me feel, feel validated. My whole life feels like a cognitive disconnect. Um, so Claudia shares, it was abs actually my favorite, my first. Oh, that's right, Claudia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the Stephen West one. What a beautiful story and a gorgeous sweater. Absolutely a, a zero to hero. Beautiful story and sweater. That's amazing. Um, yeah. 
uh, Marina says, thank you for sharing Rachel and for your lovely words, ladies. Um, that's what this place is for Marina. That's, that's why we come to this place. Um, and I'm just so, um, I just feel so blessed that you guys are willing to share your stories with us. Um, so thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your weekend. Have a wonderful week ahead of you. We've got uh, quite a few things going on in the community this week. So for those who are signed up for the maker morning, on Thursday morning. Um, have a look at the sign up genius for those who are part of the Patreon community um, to see if you're involved with that. Sorry, that's not this week, that's the week after. Um, this week we've got Spin Group, and, which is our regular weekly meeting, and we've got uh, the Wool Circle on Friday. That's what we've got. Um, so we've got kind of a few things going on, and then Queries and Explorations is meeting next Saturday as well on May 1st. So a couple of things going on, and then the following week, um, on May 6th, we've got um, a maker morning. So if you are signed up for that, um, have a look on, on the Sign Up Genius. And I will also be posting a new Sign Up Genius on May 1st for the next three months so that you guys can go in and sign up for that. And if you're part of the Patreon community and you have not seen um, the uh, previous maker mornings and the gathering of the community, um, definitely have a look at our housekeeping post. Um, there was one that just went up for uh, April and um, I have changed the name of it, so you, of, of what we call our housekeeping, so you guys will have to uh, tell me what you think of the title. And uh, it was from James and I just thought it was so fantastic. So um, the, the link in the show notes is wrong for the uh, housekeeping post, so I will update that after the show is done, and then you guys will be able to have a look at that. And I'll post it in the Slack channel so you guys can keep up to date with everything that's going on. So until next time, happy spinning, happy knitting, and uh, thank you so much for being here, you guys, and I will talk to you next time. Bye.